Sea lettuce is a green seaweed. It's one of the three major groups of algae. And within Tauranga Harbour and the nearshore coastal vicinity in the Bay of Plenty, there's likely to be about five different species. Uh, the plant grows prolifically. It can even grow when it's detached from the substrate, from the, the seabed. It's unique in that it's only two cells thick, has sort of a, a slick, papery texture to it, but it can be quite tough. It can grow into sheets in two metres in diameter or even more. Tauranga Harbour in particular is perfect for sea lettuce. It's shallow, it's well flushed, it has a variety of sources of nutrients from uh, land runoff, even runoff from uh, roads with petrol and oil triggering primary productivity and of course sea lettuce will thrive off that. In addition to that we have populations of probably a different species of sea lettuce, closely related, uh, growing in very shallow emergent reef systems uh, right along our coasts, so from off Matakana all the way down through Papamoa and down to Makatu. These are all growing as they do in the estuary from spores uh, onto hard surfaces, just starting off in shells even, but rock where it's available, and they'll grow prolifically. During storms, of course, uh, much of this gets ripped up and sea lettuce can grow even if it's not attached, so it'll just keep growing at the edges of where the fronds are. So you end up with a very large, what we call biomass, tons of the stuff. When the weather conditions change um, and move a little bit onshore, then you get accumulations of drift sea lettuce up on the beaches, in some of the arms and inner estuary areas, but also on some of the ocean beaches if the current and weather conditions match. For research into sea lettuce, we're able to build on the recent completion of three significant PhD students. The first is Julian Huto, who had a look at the sources of sinks of nutrients as well as pollutants on all of the marine organisms inside Tauranga Harbour. Alex Port did his work on modelling the system. He needed to generate a, a mechanism whereby we could predict when blooms were going to occur. So he's achieved that by having a look at the relationship between sea lettuce blooms and the nutrient load in the harbour systems. So a model now exists that we can use to predict uh, future bloom events. Uh, Clarice Naimond had a look at uh, the effects of sea lettuce and how it smothered other elements of the uh, estuary. Uh, she found, of course, and not surprisingly, that sea lettuce had quite serious effects on these organisms and had a deleterious effect on the ecology of the harbour. New research that's starting right now and will continue for another three uh, years includes Ben Stewart's PhD project. Ben's using quite a sophisticated technique using radon and radioisotopes to track the entry of fresh water coming into the harbour, but not through the normal systems, not down rivers and streams. Rather, he's having a look at the emergence of fresh water coming in through upwelling. So this is where aquifers are delivering fresh water below the sea surface, below the seabed surface indeed. Also, in addition to that, new work is starting with international partners. These are the same people who have been hired by the Chinese government to resolve some of the Qindao issues with sea lettuce blooms. Uh, their expertise is in utilising sea lettuce, so turning a problem into an asset. And they're looking at how we might be able to enhance uh, value from sea lettuce in such things as agrochemicals. Certainly agrochemicals will enhance the uptake of nutrients on soil, make sure it stays there. And also, surprisingly, that might be able to reduce some of the methane emissions from cattle in particular that are grazing on it. So in combining all of these uh, new projects, we're in a position to understand more how we can manage sea lettuce blooms, uh, but make use of the blooms when they do occur. From looking at some of the research that had been done by the Regional Council since 1991, and indeed followed up by recent uh, PhD and MSc work from the University of Waikato, it appears that uh, there have been blooms in the past, 91, 92 in particular. A little bit later in the 90s, there was another substantial uh, bloom event. And then again, we're seeing the beginnings of perhaps another significant bloom. And these events seem to be associated with El Nino conditions. Uh, these are conditions where there's high sunlight, uh, relatively little rainfall. 
um, which is kind of odd because you expect there maybe to be extra nutrients run off the land when there's high rainfall, but that's not the case in these situations. Rather, the nutrients are coming in from deeper open ocean waters that are being upwelled to replace the water that's being blown off by the strong westerlies. And those are the conditions that we have now.